Hey folks, so I know I said I wanted to start doing videos and I was like trying to think of a really hot topic. A topic that people would think would be so cool and fun and a really cool API. Hmm. Let's talk about how to migrate your app from Objective-C. That sounds like fun, right? We know that if you're building an app in the real world, there's still going to be some Objective-C out there, right? So if you're going to really take advantage of some of the cool hotness out there, like SharePlay or Widget Kit or Swift UI, then you probably should think about starting to move your app from Objective-C. I want to talk about also why it's more important than ever in 2022 to start doing this. Different ways of migrating your app. Walk through a piecemeal migration of a basic app, including optimizing your Objective-C that's already there, creating a pure Swift layer, and then creating compatibility layer between the old Objective-C code and your new Swift code. Then lastly, we'll talk about finally removing some of that Objective-C code from your application. There are gonna be three main reasons why you wanna do this. Optimization, maintenance, and API availability. Let's start by talking about maintenance. As you may imagine, it's hard enough to find engineers, and it's gonna be even harder to find people who are, have an expertise in Objective-C. If you're gonna to wanna to maintain your app, not only is it gonna be harder to find, there's gonna be a smaller job pool of engineers with expertise in Objective-C, but Apple is gonna support it less and less. And we definitely know that from this year's WWDC. It's gonna be around Objective-C for quite a while. The operating system's built on it, obviously. But if you wanna maintain that application, it's just gonna be easier and easier, both for your job pool, as well as for whatever Apple puts out to stick with Swift and move over some of your old code over to Swift. As far as optimization, devices are gonna be more and more optimized for or Swift code and Xcode is going to be optimized for it, etc. So the support for old Objective-C code is going to be a lot harder for newer devices out there and for new IDEs as Xcode continues to get updated. Lastly, and most importantly, API availability. Just with new APIs of WWDC, they're not going to come out with support for Objective-C and it's going to be a lot harder to make that bridge between your old Objective-C code and your new uh, Swift code or new APIs built in Swift. So let's kind of go over some of the APIs that have come out uh, over the last years. So you got things like Music Kit, Widget Kit, Swift UI, uh, Swift Package Manager, Reality Kit, Store Kit 2, Crypto Kit, Care Kit, Group Activities or SharePlay, and Combine. I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of APIs that don't support Objective-C and it's only gonna grow. So if you're going to support all these, you probably want to move your code to Swift. So let's talk about how you can do this. First of all, you want to start with unit tests. When we talked about this in our episode on Objective-C with Graham Lee, we talked about how important unit tests are. So if you aren't already practicing unit tests, now is probably the best time to start doing that, especially as you migrate your code over to Swift. I mean, the good news is that we're at the point in the transition where doing that is much easier than it, it used to be. Like, mm. uh, we've now got um, a lot of features that have been added to Objective-C in order to enable exposing APIs in Swift. And I think that that is always the, <clears throat> the easiest way to do this. Um, but actually, I'm going to say step zero is write a bunch of tests. Like, you know, let's come back to this conversation, you know, pause your podcast player right now, go and make sure you have decent test coverage and don't try to migrate any code until you're confident that you have encapsulated its behavior in tests. Now that you're back uh, and you've got Have you those written tests those in tests in Swift or Objective-C? Uh, probably in Swift because where okay, we're going okay. is migrating this thing forward. Yeah. Um, okay, that makes so, sense. So <clears throat> I've got my Objective-C framework that is exposed uh, through, you know, bridge to Swift and I've written my tests in Swift. That is absolutely a great bedrock on which to do any porting because you rewrite everything in Swift and you run the same tests. Yeah. Um, what you may find is that some of the Objective-C APIs don't work particularly well. Like you've got uh, optionals where you know that the thing shouldn't be optional. And so you use the nullability keywords in Objective-C yes. to, to tell Swift that these extra constraints exist and it can rely on them. You've got 
collections, like sets or arrays, that are saying that they are an array of any, and you need to use the Objective-C generics to tell it that it's an array of strings or an array of numbers or whatever. And then yeah, and then it becomes easier to use in Swift, and then you do the port to Swift. So I think step zero is tests. Let the tests tell you where your Objective-C API is not bridged very well and build the bridge so that you've got a better API. And then rewrite in Swift once you have the API you want and the behavior that you know you're not going to break. There's going to be two main strategies for doing this. You could either do a complete rewrite or a piecemeal upgrade. Each has their own advantage. If you're going to do a rewrite, you may as well redesign your UI or your API anyways in a more Swifty way. Um, and maybe this is your opportunity to move over to Swift UI. That's something to think about. Uh, piecemeal means there's going to be multiple implementations for your code if you still need to support Objective-C throughout your application, but it's going to be a lot smoother, hopefully, for your customers and users. Uh, like I said, this is your opportunity to convert your application to Swift UI. So if you already have UI kit code in Objective-C, maybe now is the time to move over to Swift UI. If you go with a more piecemeal approach, um, you can still keep some of that Objective-C co code slowly as you migrate over and have it already call uh, some of the new Swift code as well. If you're doing a rewrite, this is an opportunity to remove older OS support in your application. But if you need to support uh, older OS as a piecemeal approach, probably is the best way to go. Let's talk a little bit more about this piecemeal approach and how we could do it. Um, and that's what we're going to focus on today in this presentation. We're going to start off by talking about how to optimize your Objective-C code so that it's better compatible with any of your new Swift code. Next, we'll talk about building a pure Swift layer that doesn't rely or depend on any Objective-C code. Then we'll talk about how to take that pure Swift code and bridge it so it's still available in any Objective-C APIs that you still have in your code base. And lastly, we'll talk about removing all the old Objective-C code in your application once you've done that. And then profit. Yay! Let's start by talking about a classic application, your classic Objective-C app with a view controller and some sort of database that it can pull up members or list people, and then how it draws that information onto a typical UI table view, right? So pretty simple. Here's an example of some of that code. We have a table view controller, some sort of call that pulls up the uh, members from a remote API call or from a database. And then it can use that list of members to then draw each cell with the different uh, folks uh, from that API call. Our members have all sorts of information attached to it. Again, this is all Objective-C code with a get members call and just something that pulls in a dictionary and defines each uh, item from that dictionary. We're going to use some uh, NS options here, which is kind of a way to do uh, a bit flag so that if members are interested in different tags, for instance, they can tag have multiple tags. This is similar to how uh, you could do like an option set in Swift. Um, we have that in Objective-C. So we have a classic app. How do we then optimize the existing code uh, that's in Objective-C so it's easier to use in Swift? Because what you'll find is there's a couple of things that just aren't supported in classic Objective-C. What we're talking about here, of course, is nullability and generics. And there's ways you can now apply that to your Objective-C code so that way you can know exactly what you're working with. Because um, let's start off talking about like nullability, for instance. If we call any of these APIs, what will look like in Swift is we'll get like with optionals, uh, implicit optionals, and we won't know if what we get back is nil or not. Um, this can kind of drive you a little bit crazy. Um, and it just, it's faulty code, right? This goes with a lot of uh, the stuff here with these properties, right? Some of these are just gonna be implicit optionals. There are gonna be pointers where you don't know if they're nil or not. What's nice though, is we can take this problem and we can fix it by using some syntactic sugar, I guess, to kind of specify whether a certain property or a certain function returns something that's nil or not. All we have to do is add, for instance, on these properties, either non-null or nullable. And now when we pull these properties up in Swift, we'll see 
in fact, that we ha know that whether they are nil or actually not nil, as opposed to that implicit unwrapped optional. And we can do this too with our method here on top. So we have members and error, right? We don't know if members or error could be nil or not. We have no way of telling. So what we can do then, again, is mark it whether it's non-nil or nullable, depending on how we want um, what values we want to return from our uh, different methods. That covers nullability, but one thing I actually have just become um, more aware of is the ability to do generics. We have some some of these non-generic uh, methods here that return uh, members, but we want to specify actually that the array returns array of members and not just any. This is kind of a pain in the neck to deal with because then you got to cast or do it do it if let, and how do you deal with when it doesn't cast properly? So what we can do is we can use um, angle brackets to specify that the array is an array of members. And now Swift will in fact get the members properties or members array instead of just an any array. So this takes care of just making your Objective-C code more usable and easier to deal with when it comes to Swift. And it's also gonna help when we uh, create our pure Swift objects that we're gonna create uh, in Swift, because then these can kind of act in the same way and we know how they behave. So when you're creating a pure Swift layer, one thing you want to do is you don't want to make this code necessarily have to work in Objective-C, because you're not going to have to support Objective-C in the future. And if you want this code to be future-proof, you don't want to have um, things like NS object. Um, or not using structs and things like that. Use structs, use whatever is best optimized for Objective-C. Um, so in this case, we're gonna be using, uh, we're gonna convert our member object, we're gonna rename it to defunct member so we can still have it there, um, but we won't, we'll eventually remove it. And I kind of mark these as defunct as a way to remind myself that I wanna remove it. And then what you wanna do is then create a struct uh, for your member. So obviously this member won't work in Objective-C because it's a struct and structs aren't compatible. I also I create an in-between type uh, member response so that way I can easily decode the JSON. Um, if you want to, you could do use custom codable stuff. You could do that too if you don't wanna create this in-between layer. What we have here now is the ability to uh, natively just decode the JSON and be able to use it into a struct. And then with our facade and our repository, which is gonna be the way we're going to be able to pull members. Um, so here, instead of doing the array and error arguments, we're gonna actually take advantage of result. We can really take advantage of Swift and its uses. So while there's stuff like structs or enums or result types, um, async away, tuples, all sorts of stuff that's not available to us necessarily in Objective-C, um, we could really take advantage of that by uh, building a pure Swift layer. This will be the code that will be used in the future. So then you're probably asking, well, if we do all this stuff with enums and structs, how are we going to actually use this if, our, say, our view controller is still written in Objective-C? Well, that's where building an Objective-C compatibility layer comes in. So we already have our struct here, uh, member, and we have uh, our tags, which is going to be, we're going to use a set in this case of strings. Uh, what we want to do then is be able to like have a bridge, I guess, because for instance, our cell for row at index path, is it going to be able to use this member type since it's a struct and it's not available in Objective-C? And there's also other types too, like ints that aren't necessarily supported in some cases or optional strings set, you know, that's another one. How are we going to make this compatible in Objective-C? I usually have been doing is creating what's called a, a deprecated or wrapped type that will have, you know, it'll be based on an NS object. It'll have everything available to it using the at Objective-C members attribute at the top. And what we'll do is it'll wrap the type that we're using in this case member and make all the uh, necessary conversions so that that type is available in Objective-C. So for instance, our color value, which was an int, optional int, we can then take that and convert it to an NS number that's optional and compatible with Objective-C. Uh, details, um, you know, tags, we'll make that into just a simple array. Things like that, that now make member available in Objective-C without necessarily crippling member so that it's not uh, best optimized for Swift. We could do this with our repository call for get members where we have a result type. We could do something like what I'll do is I'll create a method called something like legacy sync 
where it will take that re result type and convert it into a call where it takes in a successful type and a failure type that are both optional and then it can do whatever it needs to do with it and that will be available in objective c we just take wrapped.get members and then we go ahead and we can uh, take each object in the array if it's there and wrap it and make it into a deprecated member so it's available in objective c and then we call legacy sync and now uh, we have a deprecated repository so we have access to those members you'll have some of these types that are not available in Objective-C and we'll need to map them over. And that's what the Objective-C compatibility layer will do. We'll take the stuff that is not available in Swift and using Objective-C attribute or Objective-C members or NS object or NS number or whatever you need to do so it's available in Objective-C and make it available in Objective-C. So for instance, with our table view cell uh, where we were getting each member at a certain row, um, we're just gonna be seamlessly moving it over to the deprecated member, which is a wrapped type, and be able to use that in our UI table view cell. Now that we've done that, it'll be a lot easier for us to remove the Objective-C code. So let's say we want to move the UI table view controller over to Swift. And we won't need that compatibility layer, but we could still use that Swift layer. We can do that now because all we'll have to do is remove those types from our Xcode project. And from that point, we'll be able to have much cleaner code and it'll make it a lot easier for us to remove those objects from our Xcode project. If you want to learn more, uh, I did a couple episodes on this topic. Shai was on and he uh, talked about his book, Expert Swift, and they have some stuff in that book, the Ray Winderlich book on Objective-C and working with that in Swift. I had an episode with Graham where we talked specifically about Objective-C and the differences between it and Swift and why they are so different and why uh, Swift is kind of the way of the future. If you want to learn more about the different approaches, I also did an article on upgrading old apps. Uh, you'll definitely want to check that one out as well. And also, if you want to take a look at some of the code I used, I have a GitHub repo called Classic App, which has each step detailed out in a separate branch. So you'll definitely want to check that out too. Lastly, there is some documentation from Apple about importing Objective-C APIs, and that will talk all about the different ways of going about that as well. So what did we talk about today? why you should migrate your Objective-C code now to Swift, the different methods of whether you want to do a full rewrite or piecemeal, and then we went into details of that piecemeal approach and step-by-step -step process of migrating your old Objective-C code. Uh, specifically optimizing the Objective-C code with nullability and generics, writing a pure Swift layer and taking advantage of Swift, Objective-C code compatibility layer for Swift so that you can easily remove the code and still take advantage of Swift to its full extent. And then how to remove those pieces of code, uh, like the compatibility layer and all the Objective-C code once you no longer need it. Thank you so much for joining me for this video. Uh, please hit like and subscribe if this was helpful to you. Let me know. Uh, I'm hoping to do even more videos later. So please let me know if there's anything else I can do um, or any topics you want me to cover that hopefully are not as boring as this. But uh, you're going to thank yourself once you do this and it's going to be a lot easier to plug in some of the cool stuff that you need to do. Again, hit like and subscribe and let me know if you have any feedback. Thank you. Have a good one.